Welcome to In The Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm really excited to have on the show today Sanjeet Paul Chowdhury, who is the founder and CEO of Platform Thinking Labs and is best known for his work on platform business models and multi-sided network effects. And if that sounds a little confusing, we'll get into that a little bit later today. He's also the author of the number one bestseller, Platform Scale, which he uh, crowdfunded on Publishizer.com, which is pretty cool because I crowdfunded my book um, either before or after him. I can't actually remember. I remember it was around the same time. That's actually how I, I spotted Sanji to begin with and got and pre-ordered his book. So it's cool to see that he leveraged that platform and, uh, and to write about platforms. So Sanji, th- thanks so much for being on the call with us today. Thanks, John. Pleasure being here. Yeah. So... Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, that was a really brief, like that was a quarter of the bio that you have on your own page. You've done a lot of things. You've mentored um, at 500 startups. Um, you've been a part of a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, events, and you've spoken in a lot of different places all around the world, um, and are considered a thought leader on, on platforms. So, tell us a little bit about kind of your background. I'm really curious about your story, how you got into this. Sure. Yeah. So. Um... I, I've always been fascinated by the whole idea of why uh, businesses fail. And there's a lot of different approaches that have been taken into this uh, whole notion of understanding business failure, whether it's from the perspective of uh, founder psychology or from the perspective of how you do innovation, which is what Lean Startup looks at. And in this whole process, um, I, I started this journey into looking at business failure back when I was running innovation uh, for Intuit and my uh, a lot of my work was uh, to start new businesses for Intuit and uh, take them from zero to revenue. And uh, during this whole process of looking at different schools of thought around why things fail, what I figured was that there was very little being talked about the change in business models that's happening because of two specific things, because of one, uh, the fact that the world is getting more connected. And so you have new kinds of business models that leverage connectivity. And two, because there's so much more data in the world, you have new kinds of business models because of that. And what I figured was that a lot of an increasing number of companies uh, were starting in this whole space of new business models, whether building social networks or marketplaces or platforms and they were uh, repeatedly failing for a set of issues that were very poorly understood. So that's what caught my fancy around the time, uh, some uh, four years back. And I started looking at understanding why are these emerging business models fundamentally different uh, from the way the traditional business models worked and how do you manage these emerging business models in a way that sometimes may seem counterintuitive to a to the way a traditional model would be uh, managed. And that's where I got into this whole space of looking at platform business models, and that's what I've been doing over the last four years as such. And in, in general, the way I go about it is um, I try to be rigorous, so there's uh, uh, a significant research element involved where I um, chair the research um, summit at MIT called the MIT Platform Summit, and along with my two co-researchers and co-authors over there, we uh, look at from a very fundamental perspective, why are these business models different and what's, uh, what's, what are the unique challenges and issues of managing these kinds of models? What will succeed? What will fail? And uh, I also uh, do a lot of research for, the la- uh, for larger firms to a think tank called the Center for Global Enterprise that is run by some key industry leaders uh, like the chairman of IBM and the founder of Yahoo. And all of this research then feeds back into the work that I do advising companies, uh, both startups as well as uh, uh, CEOs of Fortune 100 companies in terms of understanding what parts of their business need to understand the shift towards platform business models. So that's been my journey in terms of understanding how platforms work and uh, why a lot of emerging businesses are working on uh, are working with entirely new business rules than the traditional businesses used to. 
Does that like so? I want to dive into the the idea of platforms in a second, but I'm just curious sure. right off the bat because of that that seeming evolution, at least in some context of of certain business and certain business models. Does that uh, by its nature um, mean that other types of business models are becoming obsolete because of this idea of platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. To answer that, let me uh, let me contrast platform business models versus traditional business models and. When I talk about traditional business models, I think of them as uh, pipe-based business models. And what I mean by that is that traditional businesses used to work in this linear fashion. You uh, source material, you uh, assemble an end product or service, and then you serve that to the consumer, and that's it. Your your job gets done, and you keep repeating this process again and, and again. So traditional manufacturing, media, retail services, all of them used to work in this model. Now, what we're seeing in today's world is the rise of a new business model where things don't move in the straight line. Instead, the business enables users to connect with each other. Users could be uh, consumers, they could be businesses, they could be uh, all, any, any party that can come, come on to your business and create value on top of it and then have somebody else consume value f- from, from it. So uh, Uber and Airbnb are classic examples. So the driver comes on board and then somebody else comes and books a, a drive a ride with the driver or Airbnb, you have hosts and um, you have the other side, uh, travelers connecting with each other. So when I talk about these two models, we're talking about two extremes. But what we are seeing increasingly in business is that a lot of businesses are participating in, uh, are, are moving in a direction where they're asking themselves which part of the business should work like a pipe and which part should work like a platform. So think of Amazon, for example. It's always been a retailer, but then it's it's also done a lot of things in a platform fashion where the uh, third-party merchants can come on board or where um, you have this whole Kindle direct publishing platform where writers can just come and connect directly with readers. So the question that I think businesses need to ask today is which part of our business can be can can still work like a pipe and which parts can benefit from adopting this platform approach. And what I want to clarify is that the platform approach is not just about becoming the next Airbnb or Uber. The platform approach is more about asking two or three kinds of questions. One is um, what, who can I connect and facilitate interactions between that will help me build a stronger, more engaged community around my business. Uh, a second question is what am I uh, creating in-house that I can put outside to the ecosystem, put outside uh, to an external user to do. So if I'm Walmart and I have a delivery uh, vans delivering uh, goods to people, um, can I out? Can I put this delivery out onto a platform where uh, any anybody with a, with a spare van can come in and deliver that? Those are the kinds of questions that... Um, traditional companies which need to look at platforms can can start asking because it's not a question of completely your entire business from one to the other it's more of looking at what elements can be tweaked to become more efficient using the power of that a connected world offers and so i i think the idea when we hear about something like uber or airbnb uh i I look at that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, they've done impressive things. It's awesome. Would love to have been the brains behind it and have produced that. But at the same time, when you look at these platforms, I mean, these guys, these these guys hustled and they worked really hard. And I think there were a lot of pitfalls, and I think they could have failed in a lot of different ways. So I'm sure. curious, like, how realistic is it to actually be able to build a successful platform? I mean, is it is it something that you could actually bootstrap, or is it more something that has to go through uh, Silicon Valley, get the funding? Um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so there, there are two ways of thinking about it. One is that you start a platform from scratch. And in that case, there's a whole challenge of building that whole community, interacting community around yourself and building those network effects where more producers come on board and that they attract more consumers who in, in turn attract more producers. So Getting to that is much more difficult than just getting to a base of consumers who you are selling a product or a service to. So that whole uh, drill is much more difficult. What I feel, uh, where I feel companies are uniquely positioned is if they already have a significant consumer base, if they already have people who are buying uh, uh, or consuming some uh, value from them. And if they can ask themselves how they could convert this consumer base into a platform where 
either they uh, get in third parties to start serving these consumers or whether they connect the consumers in various ways so that they exchange things between themselves. That's the kind of uh, model in which this whole idea of platforms can be used. I'll, I'll give you a very specific example. If you think of uh, Patagonia, the company that makes sweaters, uh, they uh, they have been been in the business of selling sweaters all through. Uh, now, what they did recently was uh, they decided that uh, their sweaters were actually very durable, and so they did not uh, they did not need to be replaced that often. But still, people want to change styles, and so what they did was they they partnered with eBay to launch a platform for Patagonia, which is a platform where people who have Patagonia sweaters can come in and trade it or resell it to other people who want Patagonia sweaters but can't afford them. And so they've created the secondary marketplace for sweater exchange. Now, in the long run, this has interesting implications because A, it's it's creating the brand impression that Patagonia sweaters really last because the thriving platform for secondary exchange. B, it's making the value of the Patagonia sweater more, more uh, higher because there is a very clear resale value. And C, it can potentially allow Patagonia in the future to charge even higher for the sweater upfront because there is a resale value attached. So what we're seeing is that the traditional model of Patagonia did not change, but they realized what could be done using a platform approach to to, to organize their existing base of com- consumers in a new way, all of which does not need Silicon Valley funding, does not need to be the next Airbnb or Uber, does, does not, will not probably become the next multi-billion dollar success, but it, it still brings a lot of uh, efficiencies and uh, makes a business model that is highly relevant to the way things work today. Is is a platform business model, uh, like, what, what, is the, what is the true power in it? Is it that it's, it's so scalable? Um, what, like, what exactly makes it so, uh, I guess, so um, disruptive um, when you think about these kind of companies? Yeah, what, uh, that's, a, that's a really good point because uh, there are two or three things specifically about a platform business model that make it very interesting. And one is that you can scale without having to add res- resources. Traditionally, if you were running a pipe-based business model, you would have to keep on uh, adding employees, adding more resources, and that's how you would scale if you wanted to scale uh, revenues. And a classic example of that is if you're running an agency or a consulting firm, uh, the only way that you can scale is by bringing in more employees to serve the client, uh, to serve a growing client base. Uh, But what happens with the platform is that you can scale not by increasing your fixed costs, but by ensuring that you're creating more and more ways for people outside your business to benefit from the value that your business is creating. So a classic example of... uh, the way a consulting or an agency model would work in the case of platforms is what an uh, an Upwork or the freelancer.com does. It essentially creates the same value in terms of clients coming in and offering projects, but instead of scaling employees in-house, it connects these clients with freelancers all around the world. And that's that's what makes it extremely scalable, where you can actually scale the rate of value creation without scaling the attendant costs involved. This is what's happening with Airbnb and hotels as well. If hotels have to serve more guests, they have to build more rooms. If Airbnb has to serve more guests, it has to ensure that more hosts come on board and those hosts are well curated and those hosts are well engaged. And as long as those things are sorted out, uh, Airbnb can continue getting more and more guests on board. So that's the first part of why these things become scalable. The fact that you don't have to own and manage these resources internally to scale value creation. But the second part of it is that, yes, you don't own all of these guys, but more importantly, they they start interacting with each other directly and they start creating network effects out there in the ecosystem. And what that means is that the more hosts come on board, Airbnb Airbnb does not have to keep getting more guests. More guests start coming in automatically when they see that more hosts are coming on board. And when more guests start coming in, many of those guests figure out that this is a place where um, a lot of activity is happening. These convert into hosts. And so more hosts come on board uh, by guests converting into hosts and vice versa. And so in a way, the community and the ecosystem around the platform, it's, it starts to grow of its own accord. And it's these two things. One is the lack of ownership. And the second is the fact that because of this, the whole uh, network feeding into each other, there is uh, growth of itself beyond a point without 
the company having to hustle for that. These are the two things that make platforms really scalable. So what are, is there like a framework to look at this? Um, so assuming that you're not starting from scratch, because I, I, I'm actually really curious about the idea of how you mentioned there were two ways to look at it, either starting from scratch or, or working uh, or, or developing an existing um, business or system into, into or maybe an element of that into a platform. Um, right. So I'm curious, is there a framework to look at that? Like if I have a business, okay, I'm generating revenue, I have a business model. Is there like a set of questions or a, a way I can approach that to say how I how could I actually turn this into into a platform? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think uh, there there is uh, the, uh, if I could propose one of uh, several ways of doing this, there there, there mm-hmm. are probably th- a few different templates in which this could work. But let's let's take one such example. If you have uh, an ex- existing user base, uh, what I would look at is how engaged is that user base and what are the kinds of actions that the user base is taking in your business beyond just consuming what you're giving them. Uh, because uh, what what you need when you have an existing user base is you need to have uh, a user base that is highly engaged beyond just consumption and a user base about which you can determine a unique form of data that nobody else can determine. And that's usually the starting point of a platform. If you have a unique form of data that nobody else has, then you can use that data to connect these users to somebody else and get value from them as well. So uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you, um, if you, it's, it's probably um, a, a large company example that I'm going to give, but it's so uh, divorced from the world of platforms that it's interesting to think about them. So mm. there is there is this uh, food and spice company called McCormick Foods, which sells spices, right? And they came up with this idea that selling spices is fine, but if you could build a platform around people who are buying spices, that would be more interesting. And so they created this uh, new feature called Flavor Print, which asks you what kind of food you like. And based on that, it creates a data flavor print about uh, what your food preferences are. So it will it'll give you a score across you're so high on cheesy foods, you're so high on uh, sweet versus savory. And so it it across 38 different things at uh, 38 different parameters, it, it ranks your taste index. Now, what it does after that is because of using the taste index, it starts recommending recipes that align highly with that taste index. Okay, so the first step was to get a unique form of data, which was create this taste index. Now, using this data, you're giving new kinds of value, which is highly personalized. So you're getting these recipes, which are based on your taste index. Once, once as can consumers, you start engaging with these recipes, what happens is two things. One, uh, every time a recipe is given out to the consumer, served to the consumer, there's uh, a link back to which McCormick spice can be used to make that food. So there's uh, direct sales. But more importantly, you're strengthening the platform where you connect people with similar taste profiles and allow them to swap recipes and swap tweaks on the recipes, hacks on how you can make the, uh, t- make the taste even better. And Post this, there this this whole thing has now become so successful that they've actually spun off this whole platform division into a new company uh, called uh, Vivanda. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to create this taste profile. They're trying to make it an industry standard so that tomorrow, if Nestle wants to sell you something, it's going to put the taste profile on the packaging so that you can come and see how closely it aligns with your taste profile. And it's a fascinating direction in which they're taking this whole thing, all of which started by asking one question. We have all these people buying spices from us. What's the unique form of data that we can gather about these guys? That's really good. I'm just writing that down. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Good stuff. So, this, now, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was just saying that there's, uh, there's tons of interesting examples of how traditional companies are using this, and that's where a lot of... Uh, very interesting learning comes in in terms of how you can do it with without the Silicon Valley way of doing it. So I'll just throw out one more example since you uh, asked what are the various ways of going about it. So if, if you take the Silicon Valley example, um, one of the platforms that became really successful is Facebook when it launched Facebook Connect. Now with Facebook Connect, you can log into any site all around the world and Facebook tracks your data across all these websites. So it, it, makes, it, it makes Facebook just so much more uh, powerful. Now, what what what, uh, what happens is uh, 
Facebook wo- works very well on that front in uh, uh, on 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 the internet and and mobile. Uh, in the physical world, BMW asked this question: How can we become a platform, and how can we act like Facebook? So BMW came up with this whole strategy where they said, "Why don't we use the car key as the single sign-on to everything in the real world? So why can't the car key open hotel doors? Why can't the car key unlock train seats?" And so they converted the car key into a digital app and a digital uh, a key as well, where you can just open your car key using this digital key. Uh, you can just open your car using this digital key, and then you can drive around in that car, go uh, check into a motel using your digital key. Uh, you download the the, uh, the the key for a particular room. You can enter. You can uh, when you're not using your car, you can use the same key to pay for uh, a train seat and unlock it. And so essentially, what they're trying to create is they're trying to create a Facebook Connect for the real world. You can do a single sign-on into all kinds of real world physical goods and services, and that's where. Thinking in terms of these platforms becomes important because if you know how platforms work at an um, at at a fundamental level, you can see that a lot of the things that Facebook is doing with Facebook Connect can be translated to what BMW is doing with its uh, single sign-on key around the world. Yeah. Now, uh, now, tell me if it sounds like this stuff is pretty sophisticated in that regard. Like you need a certain level of engineering behind these uh, types of platforms. Is that correct? Yes, so there are uh, companies always have two choices. You uh, you could build it all yourself the way McCormick and BMW have done, or you could partner with somebody like an eBay the way Patagonia has done. So there's uh, always one of these two choices that you could take. What's I guess then in terms of like maybe a lower hanging fruit for somebody who's looking at doing this? Like I guess can you elaborate more on those ways that you can leverage existing platforms? Um, so if if you you know if you because I, I think a lot of people will come to this and say, wow, this is an interesting idea, but it's not my core business. Um, how do I you know, get the resources to spend time doing something like this? Um, I, I, I don't know. That's kind of a ge- really general question, but I'm just curious if you've, you've seen that um, challenge. Yeah, so, so let me answer that question in two different ways. Sure. One is uh, that uh, when, when you're partnering with somebody or when you're using another platform instead of uh, building your own, you always have to realize that the the core value that is there, which is the data about the user, is not owned by you. It's owned by the external platform. So that's just uh, something to be aware of. Um, but let me uh, spin the question in a different direction. And let's say it's all good for McCormick Foods and BMW, but uh, what does it mean for a small business that's uh, getting started out and that's got a few million in revenues? How can it start thinking about all of this? Uh, so there are a few different things that I think... Um, even small businesses, entrepreneurs need to be really aware of. One is the fact that external platforms give you ridiculous leverage when it comes to uh, growing things really fast because there is always a period in the life of an external platform when you can, when its governance or its internal monitoring is not strong enough, but its growth is already quite high. And if you can use an external platform during that period, you can use it to grow your business really fast. I'll give you a few examples um, where uh, this has been done. So um, if you think of Pinterest, uh, when Pinterest was starting out, initially there was not a lot of uh, internal monitoring and governance. What what uh, the platform was focused on entirely was how could, could it grow its user base. And as I mentioned on on platforms, you always have producers and consumers. And what many platforms do in the early days is they try to showcase the best producers so that consumers get more engaged. Now, what Pinterest did around the time was it hand-selected a few people who uh, were really good producers and were really running really engaging pin boards um, on, on Pinterest. And then it started recommending these few people to everybody who signed on to Pinterest as a new consumer. As a result, these few people developed followings in millions, and today many of them run uh, businesses selling to their user base, which makes tens of millions of dollars. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a way to be aware of what platforms are launching out there. And if you can be early enough to a platform that's growing really fast, but that hasn't um, got things fully under control in terms of uh, governance and those kinds of factors, 
then you can benefit from the growth of the platform. You can ben- you can get benefits into your own business by um, leveraging the growth of that particular platform. And we've seen this uh, again and again and in many different cases. Even today's big platforms like Airbnb used uh, an existing platform like Craigslist to get traction. Uh, YouTube used MySpace to get traction because uh, people, uh, uh, you know, artists on YouTube used to, uh, artists on MySpace needed a way to show their uh, videos to their uh, to their uh, following and so there are many different cases where uh, even platforms have used existing platforms early enough to get a lot of traction so what what i would uh, think of is if you're running a small business ask yourself this question what are the available platforms outside where what i create whether it's my products or whether it's content about my products or content about my whole space uh, could get traction and which of these are early enough for me to benefit from the platform's growth and build a following out there. And that's something that uh, one should actively monitor because in a world of platforms, getting early access to a fast-growing platform is an unfair advantage. It's like being born in a politician's family and getting all that access because of, uh, uh, you know, because by virtue of birth. So just getting into the right platform at the right time is, is uh, a whole source of unfair advantage. I love that idea, um, and it actually changes, shifts the conversation away from the idea of, you know, building platforms and and just the idea of leveraging platforms. So I'm I'm super curious about this. I guess what you know, because the first mover advantage on something like that, like leveraging a new platform, is is great, and I see the power in it. Um, I also feel like certain people who already have audiences elsewhere are able to capitalize that faster than those who, you know, might just be starting from scratch. So I'm just curious, right. what do you have any like? What is your your perspective on this from your experience that you've seen people who are 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 fast to adopt a platform and what have they done uh, to take advantage of that the right way? Like, are there and, and maybe that's too general, maybe it's platform specific, but I'm just curious if there are certain takeaways you've seen from your experience and from the people you've you've worked with. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the thing is that if you already have a following, if you already have a network, you can you can leverage it across platforms. So you can take your network from one platform to another in various different ways. That goes without saying, and that should happen. Even if you're um, starting from scratch, there are ways to use these platforms in a way that makes it very uh, useful for you. I'll just take my own example. When I started out my blog three years back, uh, today it's uh, a a very active blog with a huge leadership. But three years back, I started from scratch. And I wanted to apply the same principle to my own work. And so so I looked around for the best uh, platforms that uh, that, that were growing and where my content would be useful. And Three years back was the time, uh, three and a half years back, mid-2012, when Quora was still, I would say, emerging. It was not. It was big enough, but it was not big enough to uh, branch into all kinds of things. And at that point, Quora was heavily focused on startups and growth and how do you think about, uh, what are the strategies to think about growth? And this worked very well for me because a lot of my initial blog posts were all around growth. And so... I use those posts to answer the lo- answer the lot of questions and link back to the blog, and that led to huge traction initially. If you see some of my Coda posts, there they have close to hundred thousand views or more, uh, and these were just answers to questions made at the right time. So that was a case of identifying the right platform at the right time. Uh, a second example would be when Medium came into the scene two years back, and it was still um, an invite-only platform. Uh, at that point, if you could get an invite onto Medium, you could get a uh, reasonably huge exposure. And so by the time my blog following was also quite big, so um, I, what I did was um, I took a um, slice out of BuzzFeed's playbook. What BuzzFeed does is it goes on to the edit, sees what's popular, and then repurposes it uh, and puts it on BuzzFeed using uh, certain mechanisms. And that's how it spreads. So I looked at my blog blog posts, which were the most popular ones, and I read it, them and repurposed them for Medium. And nearly all of them got picked up by editors. At the time, uh, Medium used to have a very strong editorial team before they decentralized everything. But ne- nearly all of them got picked up by the editors, and a lot of these blog posts have more than 100,000 views as a result. So it's all about finding mm. the right platform at the right time, because if you if you go to Koda now, it's, it may or may not work the same way. Um, or let's put it this way, even now it would work well if you chose to answer the right question 
question at the right time. There's, there's always the momentum and um, uh, that a question has over its life cycle. If somebody asks a question, it's get, getting a lot of uh, uh, users joining in and following the question, then Koda also starts promoting the question to a lot of people. And so if you answer that question at that time, you probably get a lot of leverage. But if you answer the question that's four years old and which just has not had any activity in the last two years, then nobody's going to uh, really see that and Koda's not going to push it as well. So you need to look at a lot of these factors and insert yourself in a highly relevant and value adding fashion at the right place at the right time. Gosh, that poses a whole so many different challenges, but it's a good, it's like a good way to think about it because it, it again, it's, it's, yes. it's like, I don't want to get confused and shifted from what I'm normally doing, but when a platform presents itself and I say, Oh, this could be a good opportunity. Um, I, I am actually, I'm not doing myself uh, a good service by not at least attempting to take advantage of it. Is that correct? Yes. Well, the thing is, uh, when you're running a business, there are two kinds of things that you're always doing. You're doing more of what already works and you're trying to look for the moonshots. And moonshots are always going to work on a portfolio model. You're going to have to try 10 different things and one of them will work. So that's how you got to see uh, all of these platform related things as well. Uh, you you may be in the business of selling roller skates and you can you sell 100 a day and you can keep doing that. Uh, but if you want to sell 10,000 in a day on one, one specific day, then you have to try 10 of these things and one of those things will work out. So it'll still, uh, the thing is that there will be, uh, you know, as with anything that has a huge potential upside, you have to try a few different things before you uh, see something work. Uh, that in itself is a really powerful idea. Um, I love it. Okay, you know, I could probably go on uh, talking all day about this, but I want to respect your time. I know we're already a little bit over. Um, so I kind of wanted to uh, maybe give you the floor and see if you have any other parting advice for people who are starting um, online businesses or, or have developed them and are growing them, maybe ways for them to think about how do I integrate uh, platform thinking into into what they're doing? Yeah, well, uh, I'll, let me let me um, lay out a few a couple of things that uh, will and will not directly involve platforms. So there are a few different things that I think are really important, and it feeds back to the way I run my own work as well. Uh, one thing that I see a lot of founders doing is that they have a really good company brand online. They don't really have a good personal brand. And I think that especially as a startup, it's very important to have a strong personal brand because the most persistent resource uh, that you have across a series of startup at attempts is uh, your personal brand. Uh, whereas if you just focus on entirely all your efforts on creating the company brand, if you have to move shift direction into a new space, you're not carrying that equity with yourself. Uh, and But if you have a, a personal brand that you have, which is strong enough, then that helps you move in, in new directions as well. And so that's something that I believe is extremely important when you're running a business online. The second thing that I would think of is uh, take an approach, take a leaf out of the Instagram playbook and ask yourself, why did Instagram become so big? Uh, and the question, the thing is that Instagram became big fundamentally because it allowed users to do one simple thing. It allowed users to create something on it and then throw it onto an external network. And it was just a simple thing. If, if uh, come, come to my app, create something and then throw it elsewhere where people can see it. People did not have to promote Instagram. Instagram was promoted every time people threw face, uh, their photos onto Facebook. And so ask yourself, what is it about my business that people can come in here, create something of their own, and then want to show it off somewhere else? If you can create a mechanic of that sort, you're automatically leveraging the path of networks and platforms on which these things will travel. So always ask yourself this question. In my business, how can I enable my user to be an artist and show himself off? Because users want to express themselves, show themselves off. Uh, they don't necessarily want to talk about your company. And this is the only way you can integrate these two things. So I'd just like to leave those two uh, ideas as a parting thought. Powerful stuff. I love that. Um, wow, a lot to take from this, Sanjeet. I really appreciate uh, your knowledge, your wisdom, and, and the time you've given us. Where can people get a hold of you uh, or your work or check out more um, about what you're working on and, uh, and, and get your book and all that? Sure. So um, I've got one book out, Platform Scale, uh, on Amazon, um, and uh, I can I can send that link across, and uh, if if that can be posted, um, there's a second book that's coming out called Platform Revolution, which is about how platforms are changing different industries and what 
uh, what is the right time to enter the particular industry and um, build a platform out there. Um, I write a blog uh, called Platform Thinking. You, if you go to Google and just search Platform Thinking, that's the first link that should show up. Uh, it's The link is Platform Ed, uh, Platform Education, so Platform Ed dot info um, and uh, that's uh, if you visit my blog that's the one stop place where you can get into everything else that I do love it well I appreciate it Sanjeet thank you so much for your time great thanks Tom love talking to you and that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches if you'd like to check out the show notes just head over to tommorcus.com slash podcast where you'll find the latest broadcast and if you enjoyed today's broadcast please do me a favor and leave a rating and review on iTunes. That's the fastest, simplest, easiest way to support my creative work, and it would really mean a lot to me. As always, this is Tom Marcus, and if you're listening to this, you are the resistance.